the Christmas spirit is strong up here. It's sunny, it's snowing out. You're definitely gonna wanna have a strong grip when doing this. Yeehaw! I think you just need a little more practice and, uh, and a little more ability. The snowmobile is the only way to get around. This sure beats walking. You're not very good. Giddy up! Basic rules is no spitting and cheating. Icicles right above your head. Hey, John Bartell here. A winter in the holiday season is upon us, and whether you're looking for a snowy adventure or maybe just a festive experience, I got a few ideas for your holiday travels. And over the next half hour, I'm gonna take you to some of my favorite winter pit stops. And the first stop we're going to is Bear Valley, where the main mode of transportation in the winter is the snowmobile. <laughs> It happens every year. When the snow becomes too thick to plow on Highway 4 in Alpine County, Ebbets Pass is closed. And it's at that point that the whine of two-stroke engines replaces the sound of cars. Well, most of us use cars or maybe a bicycle in our daily commute, but here in the little mountain town of Bear Valley, the snowmobile is the only way to get around. On average, Bear Valley gets around five feet of snow each year. The community isn't big, about 100 or so permanent residents and 400 or so vacation homes, which drums up plenty of business for local snowmobile taxi driver, Don Hicks. Yeah, and all the cabins have my number, and that's what I do. There's about nine miles of unplowed snow covering the roads in the residential portion of Bear Valley. And up the road is the local ski resort, which is conveniently placed above the home so residents can ski right to their front doorstep. I tell them to call me when you get into town and I'm five minutes away. It may take Don a trip or two to get vacationers luggage up the hill, but his tow behind trailer makes fast work of it. This sure beats walking. Of course, paying for a snowmobile taxi isn't the only way to get around. This is probably half of the snowmobiles that are up here. Many part-time residents own their own snowmobiles and store them here at Bear Valley Snowmobile Storage and Rental. Owner Mike Denicola says his one-of-a-kind business simply exists because the roads in town can't be plowed. If they plowed them and put them on the side of the road, the homeowners wouldn't be able to get to the home. Longtime resident, real estate broker, and historian Eric Jung says before the million dollar homes, Bear Valley was a cow town. Most of the land was owned by just a few ranchers. Subdividing became fashionable in the 60s. Eric says the growing real estate almost directly correlates with the number of snowmobiles. In the first few years of Bear Valley, there were probably only five snowmobiles in town. Now there are 500 snowmobiles uh, registered with the state uh, to Bear Valley. Now you don't have to live up here to enjoy snowmobiling. You can always rent one. You're definitely going to want to remember to bring your sunglasses or goggles. Bear Valley Snowmobile Rental is one of the few places that allows you to go on a self-guided tour. I, however, opted to ride along with Steve Harima for a little history lesson. The Washoe would come from the uh, east and the Miwok would come from the west for 10,000 years they've been meeting in a place like this. Native American and mining landmarks are scattered all along Highway 4 in the Ebbets Pass area, and so are a number of alpine lakes and cabins. It's remote up here, and a snowmobile is about the only way to experience a view just like this. And we're looking at the Stanislaus River drainage right now. Well, a snowmobile will get you to your destination fast, but if you want to take the scenic route, I suggest heading to Lake Tahoe and taking a horse-drawn sleigh ride. Giddy up, giddy up, let's go. Dashing through the snow. Dwight Borges is a sleigh driver and owner of Borges Sleigh Rides at Lake Tahoe. And if you bring his horse Duke a little treat, he may just take you for a ride. These are not very good. Not very... <laughs> For 50 years now, the Borges family has provided sleigh and carriage rides to Tahoe tourists, a business which was built on a fond memory that Dwight's father, Sam Borges, had as a kid. Always a, a fun memory for my dad when he was growing up in Massachusetts to go for sleigh rides. 
Funny enough, Massachusetts is where the song Jingle Bells was actually written. Going down Salem Avenue, outside of Boston, they would have uh, sleighs where they'd race. This sleigh ride, however, is much slower, provides a romantic experience. Dwight says, on average, he witnesses a whopping 15 to 20 marriage proposals a winter. And I can say that uh, we have 100% success. Uh, oh, all right. Come on, Duke, cut. You can do it. Duke is an 18-year-old Belgium draft horse, one of the strongest horse breeds. And that comes in handy when avoiding some melting snow. Duke powered through. Yeah, he's a strong guy. One downside to Duke's horsepower, his exhaust. You know, come back. <laughs> oh, Duke, Duke. <laughs> Fart jokes aside, Borges sleigh ride truly is a memorable trip. Not just because of the beautiful views and the romantic setting, but because of the bond you get to experience between sleigh driver and his horse. Looking for a unique winter hike? Well, I suggest heading up to the Donner Summit and take a look inside the abandoned train tunnels and you'll see an icy winter wonderland inside. They were once a railroad engineering marvel, but today they're an icy hiking trail. Hey, John Bartell here, making a little pit stop at the Donner Pass train tunnels. Located just off Donner Pass Road near Summit Bridge in Nevada County is a line of concrete tunnels. Woo! You'll know you're in the right spot once you see the backcountry skiers catching air. It's not required, but snowshoes do make it a heck of a lot easier to get up to the entrance. Now abandoned, the 1,600-foot-long tunnels were once part of the Transcontinental Railroad and designed to help locomotives pass through the snowy Sierra. You're definitely going to want to bring a headlamp or a uh, flashlight. It gets a little dark in here. Designed by engineer Theodore Judah, the tunnels were completed in August of 1867 and took just over 15 months to finish. Once inside, you'll see the rock and concrete walls. They were built by Chinese laborers who used hand drills and explosives to get through the mountain. The work was dangerous and led to untold deaths. It can get a little scary walking through here, uh, seeing all of these icicles right above your head. If you have ice cleats, I suggest you bring them because water drips through the cracks and freezes on the ground, the walls, and overhead. The Donner train tunnel was used for 125 years until the rail line was rerouted in 1993. Today, it's a popular hiking trail and a testament to the hard work of Chinese laborers. Snowpack in the Sierra is vital to California's water supply and measuring that snowpack is done in a laboratory just outside Soda Springs. Well, it may not look like it, but this is a scientific laboratory. Hey, John Bartel here, making a little pit stop in Soda Springs at the Central Sierra Snow Laboratory. When the snow starts to pile up in the mountains, so does the workload for Andrew Swartz. We tend not to, to trample too much all over it in the winter because, of course, we're taking measurements of the snow. Andrew's a scientist with the UC Berkeley Central Sierra Snow Laboratory in Soda Springs. And if you want to talk to him, you have to trudge through the snow just to meet him. Sure would be nice if this was plowed. Well, scientists at the snow lab do pretty much what you'd expect. They study snow, and the research at this facility has been going on since the mid-1940s. The government, Army Corps of Engineers, and a few others realized that we didn't know enough about hydrology uh, and kind of had issues managing some of our dams. To learn more about the hydrology, scientists set up a variety of oddly named instruments in an open field in Soda Springs. That's the sonic snow depth sensor. Got our missile gauge, the neutron sensor, an infrared radiometer. Snowfall in the winter provides water for rivers in the summer. Andrew and scientists before him live at the Sierra snow lab year round so they can provide daily forecasts. Is all snow created equal? <laughs> all snow is not equal. This is very much not Sierra cement that we're used to. The Sierra cement he's talking about is hard snow packed with moisture. But Andrew says for the past several years, the lab has been recording light fluffy snow with low moisture. And that's one factor that causes drought. If we hope to come out of this drought at all or even just maintain it, we absolutely have to have good storm systems throughout the winter. Gas-powered rope toes and wild Christmas lights. More winter destinations when Bartel's Back Roads returns. You're watching Bartel's Back Roads. We're taking a tour of some of my favorite winter pit stops. And if you're looking to hit the slopes this winter, I suggest heading to Lassen County, where you can ride on California's only gas-powered rope tow, Coppervale Ski Hill. Sandwiched between the Sierra and the Cascade Mountains is Lassen County's Coppervale Ski Hill. 
home to one of California's oldest continually operating gas-powered rope tows. This is basically a framework of a truck with a rear end of a Dodge. Copper Vale is a mainly volunteer-based ski hill started by a group of locals from Westwood and Susanville in the late 1930s. Why Copper Vale? Well, this was a copper mine uh, years and years ago, like in the 30s. The original lift was a little more primitive than the current one. Picture a car chained to a tree at the top of the hill with a rope wrapped around the tire rim. Since then, though, there's been some improvements. Updated with um, safety, safety <laughs> stuff so you can't put your fingers in there. Lassen College took over the ski area in the 1940s and started the first official ski classes using this rope tow. You're definitely going to want to have a strong grip when doing this. Then in 1977, a hand-me-down Pama lift was purchased from Alpine Meadows and Tahoe so that skiers could make it to the top of the mountain. Don't let the primitive nature of the equipment fool you. It's all tested and approved by state regulators. And with an elevation of just over 9,000 feet and seven black diamond runs, Norm says Copper Vale has an impeccable safety record. And we only have like four or five people that get injured here, you know, because you're on your feet. Because there's no high-flying ski lifts, Copper Vale is an ideal place to learn to ski or snowboard. Just ask Kylie England. They're really nice and they've been helping me figure out how to do this and they've even like came over and grabbed me and like helped me navigate how to go down. If you go anywhere in Tahoe, they charge you like 300 bucks for that. Yeah. Even dogs get free lessons here. Yay! Bring it in. Emmy, bring the sled. <laughs> because this is a community-run ski hill, visitors get a community feeling, and Norm's wife, Debbie, will even give outsiders community pricing. $30 all day, 25 half day. Uh, we do ask for like a $20 donation for rentals. For the past 40 years, Norm, his wife, and many other volunteers have put their heart and soul into this place. It's really emotional for me because I was able to like make this available. At Copper Vale, accessibility for all comes before new chairlifts, modern amenities, and high price lessons. Here, it's all about the memories and the people. Why would you want to put yourself through this for 40 years? And that's really the reason why you do it, you know. It's not about you, it's about helping others. From Copper Vale Ski Area, I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back road. Yeehaw! We're gonna take a quick break here. Coming up, we'll take a train ride through the twinkling lights of Folsom. You're watching Bartell's Back Roads Holiday Edition. We're taking a look at California's winter wonderland. If you're looking for a unique lighting show this winter, I suggest hopping aboard the Folsom Valley Railway. It's a unique holiday light show where a train load of good times and smiles are pretty much guaranteed on every ride. Good times and holiday spirit, that's what Terry Gold has been hauling behind his miniature locomotive for over 30 years now. I've been playing with trains since I was this tall, so I've been playing with trains for a very long time. Terry's been in the amusement park industry for most of his life. His resume includes Magic Mountain and Disneyland, but in 1990, he bought the neglected Folsom Valley Railway. I spent a lot of time repairing the ties. I replaced all the wheels on this thing. I restored all the cars. The 12 gauge track has circled Folsom's Lions Park since the 1970s, but for the past 30 years, Terry's poured all of his time and money into upgrading and keeping the railway safe for passengers of all ages. And so I wanted to do something like this on my own, so I did a lot of research and I found that this railroad's for sale. So I came up here and bought the railroad and I've been here ever since. The railway runs year round, but December is a special time. Terry's friends over at the Folsom Zoo put up a spectacular light show. On the 10 minute ride, you're taken through a winter wonderland. Here we go. And after you're done riding the train, walk over to the zoo for more lights. 
If you're lucky, you may witness present time. Watch as the animals open up their individually wrapped gifts. History and winter sports collide in Plumas County. Next stop, the little mountain town of Johnsville for the annual longboard ski race. The Quincy High School wood shop is not normally open on Saturday, but the big race is tomorrow. Well, we're here in uh, Plumas County in uh, the heart of the Northern Sierra. Chris Murray's not a competitor in the race, but rather a carpentry teacher. And this started in the early 1860s. And his latest student is Max Breedlove. Always said I would never race until I made my own set of skis. If you're a little confused, this is no ordinary race. It's one of the most unique things about our community. Unique is one way to put it. You know, yeah, yeah absolutely. To get into this race, Max has to build a pair of wooden skis. Oh, I'm going for number one, always. Eye of the Tiger. Whoa! <laughs> this is the Plumas Ski Club Longboard Revival Race. Basic rules is no spitting and cheating. It's the oldest ski competition in the nation. And first person, man or woman across the finish line wins. This wacky event is rich with history, dating back to the 1850s. Miners were coming to a mining camps in the La Sierra, and they started making these long boards 10 to 15 feet long. In the beginning, wooden skis were means of transportation in the winter. And then once they did that, they realized, we. We could make some money by having races. Most of those races took place here in Johnsville below Eureka Lake. And today, their tradition is carried on just like it did in the 1850s. Even the competitors' clothing is authentic. I've been told that size doesn't matter. Does size matter? Oh, it definitely does. Some say the longer the skis, the faster you go, but others will tell you it's more about what you put on the skis. It's all about the dope. Dope is king, brother. <laughs> all right, so in the longboard world, dope is a nickname for wax, and each competitor applies their own blend of wax dope to make their longboards go faster. In Max's case, his blend of dope wax may have made his skis a little too fast to handle. This is my first year I haven't podiumed. I'm just really disappointed in myself. Not only that, but uh, you broke your tip. Man, there's always next year. In the end, only one man and one woman will earn the right to be longboard champion. Well, I've seen some pretty spectacular lighting displays in my travels, but there's nothing that compares to what I saw in Sassoon City. Next stop, the Gingy House. During the day, Cheveller Drive in Sassoon City looks like any other neighborhood. But at the stroke of 6 p.m., one house lights up brighter than all the others. Uno, dos, Welcome to B&A's Gingy House, a holiday display like no other. It's actually just a real house. <laughs> Believe it or not, there's a real house in there somewhere. Vincent Tanciango and Aaron Sencille are the creators, or should I say, the bakers of the Gingy House. Aaron's the head chef, I'm the sous chef. The creation of the sugary themed Wonderland started back in 2017, shortly after the two moved into the neighborhood. At the time, their house was full of boxes and empty packing material. And he goes, well, what if I turn this into a gingerbread house? And I, I was like, I dare you. And to this day, I probably regret that dare. Spanning their entire front yard to the top of their roof, every piece of the display is handmade. How long does it take you to set this up here? We actually start in the summertime. We bring everything out of storage. We start repainting everything. You may think a display like this costs a fortune, but Vincent and Aaron are actually very frugal and environmentally conscious decorators. 90% of the house is made from recycled or upcycled materials, and that's what makes it fun and challenging. The display is open to the public every night, but Friday nights are special. Every Friday night is dedicated to a theme. This year just happened to be mostly um, cultural and heritage. Vincent and Aaron are proud supporters of Sassoon City's diversity. They welcome heritage groups of all kinds to perform at the Gingy House. And on the night we went, Spanish-speaking Santa made an appearance. Do you ever bite off pieces of the gingerbread house? I have it for dessert every night. 
The Gingy House attracts hundreds of people every night from Thanksgiving to New Year's. And to do that, Vince and Aaron need the support of their neighbors. The first two years, it was direct family working on this. And then the last two years, it branched out to our neighbors, people, local, local community, community high members, school kids. and everyone has come together to you know, help make something. What started out as a dare is now actually turning into a nonprofit that'll bring art and decoration workshops to the community. All the money that we're fundraising will go back to the tools to create those art programs. Stay tuned, when we come back, we head to a bakery for a little holiday snack. Welcome back to Bartel's Backroads Holiday Edition. You know, January 6th is El Dia de los Reyes, also known as Three Kings Day. And the best way to celebrate it is with a piece of Three Kings bread. This is how it's made. Inside the bread, it has like fruits and jelly inside, and then on top, it has different kinds of candies as well. Three Kings bread, or Rosca Tareas, is traditionally served 12 days after Christmas because that's when the Three Kings brought baby Jesus presents. Did you get presents on this day? Too? Yes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times the kids leave out their little shoes and in their shoes they'll get a present from the Three Kings. Huh. The signature ring-shaped bread is not only sweet, but it also is supposed to represent a king's crown and the eternal love of Jesus. The dried fruit here uh, represents like the jewels on the crown and it represents uh, love peace and happiness. The best part of this bread inside is a very special surprise. Small baby Jesus is baked into the center for someone to find. If you find the baby Jesus, then on February 2nd, you're supposed to go to the church and you're supposed to get a baby Jesus and you're supposed to present it to the church and get it blessed. And then from there, they go and have celebrations. Um, you know, they'll have tamales or they'll have another party. <laughs> On top of the tamale party, whoever finds the baby is said to have good luck and good fortune the rest of the year. Well, if you like those winter destinations, there's a whole bunch more where that came from. Just head over to abc10.com backroads and check out our interactive map. There's a whole list of places you can visit. You can make a road trip of your own. If you got any ideas on where I should head next, just send me a message on my Facebook. I'm John Bartell. Hope to see you on the back roads.